Well, let's go over to Ephesians, Ephesians tonight, Ephesians chapter 4. I've entitled this, Affected by Remembering. I always feel somewhat of a pressure on the Lord's Supper evening because I, I want really, I desire for you to be able to enter in um, not just in a, in a factual, I guess we typically call it an academic way uh, to the supper, but actually with some level of affection and we call it heart. And sometimes I, I, bear, I, I bear the burden of feeling the responsibility of helping you. And, and I, I believe I should feel that because that's one of the appointments that I have is to be able to help and to guide you and to lead you in that direction. But I am fully aware that I can't do that. Um, and yet I feel the responsibility to do that. And so um, I just let you know that up front that um, I, I trust that you are entering in as well. And I think if we're entering in together, and that's one thing, one thing that caught my mind as I was preparing and coming in tonight is that we're, we're coming in the, into this thing tonight together as a body of believers. And therefore, hopefully that is going to help us in entering in together and being affected by remembering Paul says in this letter, beginning in chapter 4, verse 31, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, loud quarreling, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators, followers, imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. I am fairly regularly struck by the change that is evident in Saul of Tarsus. When you think about his life, what he was, and, and when you think that that person who once was an enemy of the cross, an enemy of Jesus Christ, is now writing things like this. Of course, he was translated from the darkness of self-righteousness and vain religion to the kingdom of God's dear Son or the Son of His love, as it also can be translated. And so he writes, not as one who is simply regurgitating a new religious philosophy that he's learned, but as one who truly grasped the significance of what Christ accomplished to establish peace with God for every sinner saved by grace. And remember, he considered himself chief among them. And that's one of the things I think that so moved him. I think that's one of the things that caused him to never get over what God had done for him in Christ. And what really, I think, in some ways, is at the root of magnifying the love that he sensed and that he talked really so much about, is recognizing the desperate condition that he was in, that he did not see. He was a Pharisee. He was satisfied. He wasn't looking for anything. God could have left him right where he was. And he would have lived and died knowing no difference. But he would have died apart from the love of God. 
But God intervened in his life, and he never got over it. His own life was deeply affected. And by that, I don't mean just his thinking was deeply affected. His life was deeply affected by his deep thinking. He thought deeply about the details of what God had has done for his dearly loved children. There in verse 1, Therefore, be imita imitators of God as dear children. That word that's translated dear doesn't really capture the thought. If you look at the original word, you'll see it's a form of, you'll see agape in there. It's a little extended beyond that. And the idea is a dearly beloved one, not just a dear one. I mean, that's okay. But that seems to fall short of the mark. Dearly loved children. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. A similar thought is seen over in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and, 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 and here's the word, beloved. So, so as that, as dearly beloved, as dearly loved children, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, knowing Knowing the relationship, not just that you have with God, but that God has with you, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also, so you also must do. So you hear that? Similar thought there, don't you? As in the verses we're reading here in Ephesians. And so God's love for us in Christ is the pattern for us to walk in love toward one another. And in verse 2, every phrase in Ephesians 5, 2 is really full of rich gospel truth that we're not going to delve into deeply tonight. But I want you to briefly, very briefly, just think through the phrases in verse 2. As he describes really God's love in Christ, as he says, as Christ also has loved us. Has loved us is a reference to a point in time. Now, we know from Scripture that God's love is not limited to a point in time. It is everlasting. It's an everlasting, it's an eternal love. We know that. But here, Paul brings our minds to a specific point at which God in Christ loved us. As Christ also has, he wants us thinking about that. Loved us and given himself for us, or you could translate that, translate that, translate that gave himself. It's the same kind of verb there. Gave himself, he's given himself for us. That also refers to a point. A specific act of love that is described here as an offering and a sacrifice to God. An offering and a sacrifice to God. Now, this clearly refers to Christ's fulfillment of the law, doesn't it? I mean, your mind immediately goes back to the Old Covenant, to the Old Testament, and and Paul's mind surely was thinking that as he wrote this. And, and we could 
Now take a diversion and go back to Leviticus and Numbers and, and immerse ourselves in all of the sacrifices and offerings of that old covenant, which we're not going to do. Because all of that was pointing to what Jesus Christ did, has done. He was the sacrificial Lamb of God to which all of those sacrifices prefigured. And you know that. He uses the word given or gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. And that same word given is used in Romans 4 and verse 25, as well as Romans 8 and verse 32, and it's translated delivered. He was delivered. In fact, God delivered up his own son. He delivered him up. He gave him up. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave. That's the word here. Gave, delivered up himself. Gave himself for us. That's what's in view here. That's the specific act of love that is in view here. And you'll notice he says that it was an offering and a sacrifice to God. It's interesting. It was to God. So this tells us to whom Jesus was aiming to satisfy by his sacrificial death as he, as he, as he bore that cross. We sang one, one of the lines in the song was something about he carried that cross, he bore that cross. He was doing this in reference to God. Aiming to satisfy Him by way of this death. You know, there are those who come up with this wacky theory of the atonement that they say that Jesus was paying a ransom to Satan. Have you all heard that? He was paying a ransom to Satan. Jesus was not giving himself to Satan. He was giving himself to God. He was satisfying the covenant made with his father in eternity to redeem his elect people from the awful eternal consequences of our sins. In his death, he was the Propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. That's to God. That's a, a payment to God. That's an a, appeasement that was made. It was a satisfaction that was made so that the wrath of God that hung over us is forever removed. Forever. You notice, he says, loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. Who was this? It was to God. Who was it for? And you say, well, that's a no-brainer. It was for us. And that's part of the problem that we have. These things are so familiar, we lose the significance of them, I think. It was for us. That tells us that he did this on our behalf. Now, Paul says in another place, and I just quoted it, I am crucified with Christ. Were you crucified with Christ? Did you die with Christ? Romans 6, 8 says you did. Paul says you died with Christ. Really? Really? Well, we know this is true in some way. It has to be. The Bible says so. But it is as we are united in him that we died with him. Yet, it wasn't you hanging upon that cross. It wasn't me hanging upon that cross. 
I ran into some, this thought recently, I've never heard this before, where somebody was actually pressing this idea that you and I were literally on that cross. That we were literally, it, it's almost nonsensical, but they're taking the phraseology of crucified with Christ, died with Christ, that we had to actually literally be hanging there. In fact, that's the only way true justice could be satisfied if, is, if you were there, because nobody can actually die in, this, in the place of another. That goes against the judicial system. But brethren, that's exactly what happened on the cross. He died... For us. In fact, that's what that language means. It, he did this on behalf of. It was in my place, in my stead, on my behalf, as my substitute that he gave himself in love. And, and when that thought grabbed hold of me earlier this week as I was musing upon these things, it melted my soul to think that he was, I wasn't in agony there with him. He was in agony. He bore what I could not bear, and I did not bear. He bore that. You see, this is one of the things that magnifies this whole expression of love is that which he did and which he accomplished, and he did it alone. He died as the lyrics of the song say. And some people will say that the lyrics of the song are wrong, but I say they're right. He did this alone. He died alone for you and me. And yet united with him. We died with him. We died when he died. We rose when he rose in union with him. And there's a mystery there. And he did it. You notice he says, and this is an expression of the goal for a sweet smelling aroma. Some of your translations may not have that. Maybe you can write it in for a sweet smelling aroma. Oh, that's precious. But you see, this tells us that, that God is pleased. God is fully satisfied. There is no more sacrifice for sins. The presence of the risen Christ with his Father fully secures our full forgiveness so that his sacrifice is not a stench. It is a sweet-smelling aroma. And by the way, if all there were were the sacrifices of the old covenant type, they would be a stench. But in the nostrils of God, the sacrifice of his son led toward a sweet smelling aroma. Forgiven. Did you see that in verse 32? Even as God in Christ forgave you. That's what was accomplished. And so while our sins as sins are an awful stench in God's nostrils, the offering and sacrifice of Christ that was made in love removes the odor so that there is now and forever a sweet aroma in heaven. Did you know that because of your union with Christ, you cannot spoil heaven? You cannot spoil heaven now or ever. And it's because of your union with Christ. Now, what we've just surveyed there, and each of those, these thoughts you can take and just in the quietness, and sometimes it's difficult in a room like this to get in the quietness of your own mind and, and soul. But I urge you, Tonight as much as possible. And I urge you beyond tonight in the, in the stillness of your soul, the quietness of your own meditations to enter in to these realities 
of the expression of God's love. And there are more. This is just what we're looking at tonight. But this is what we are setting our minds upon tonight. And you heard what I said. This is what we're setting our minds upon. This do in remembrance of me. This requires the activity of our minds. You can only remember what you know. You say, well, I don't like to study. I don't like to read. I don't like to listen. If you don't know it, you can't think about it. You can't remember it. You can't remember what you don't understand. So what you have thought about it and what you understand is that which the Spirit of God stirs up within you. And faith in you engages with what the Spirit teaches you through Scripture. Remember. Remember requires recollection or a calling to our minds. And so we must think upon him and what he's done as he loved and gave himself for us. And what he's doing right now. Because he ever lives to make intercession for us as the one who gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor aroma right now that aroma is filling the presence of our father and we joined with Christ there is an aroma he is satisfied with you. He's satisfied with me. Tonight, we need to remember that. We need to think about that. Exercising our minds is a critical component to our observance of this ordinance. This is not a mindless ritual by which something is conferred upon us simply by doing it. You know, line up and some... Don't pronounce over you, take the wafer, drink the cup, and move on with life. That, no, that's not what's going on. There is nothing that's conferred upon you simply by an act of a ritual. No, we are affected in the participation of this ordinance as we remember Him in remembrance of me. And the deeper our thoughts or meditations upon him and his love, which moved him to give himself for us, the greater the impact upon us personally and corporately, the deeper our thoughts. Your mind is given to something. Your mind right now is given to something. Every day your mind is given to something. What I am suggesting to you is the more that we, the more deeply we think, the more deeply we muse, meditate upon this great manifestation of God in Christ to us, the greater the impact is going to be. So how are we going to be affected? How are we going to be affected by this? Well, as the aroma of Christ fills us, and as the aroma of Christ fills our gathering, as that faith which, which has been gifted to you, that faith which you, by which you are engaging with Him, is at work. We are moved in our souls, not just delineating the details of whatever it is that you're delineating about God and his, and his love and the demonstration of his love, you, you, all of those things can just be details. But if we are musing deeply upon them and connecting in faith 
with them. The Spirit of God is at work in us and our affections are stirred toward Him who loved us and loves us. And so we're we're moved to say thank you. And you know, we enter in. We enter into the, that's one of the things that stirs us with some of the songs that we sing. We enter in, don't we, with the expressions of those songs that communicate in poetic and lyrical fashion these glorious truths of the gospel. And, they, and it stirs us. It's, it's not the melody, although the melody, it's nice when it fits the words, you know, but it's those truths. But not only are our affections stirred, we are moved in our wills to imitate God as His dearly beloved children. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear, beloved children. To walk in love, patterned after him. And what does that look like? Verse 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, evil speaking be put away from you. You, 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 you can't hang on to that. You, you say, well, that... So is that so? So is that just a command? I've got to do this? No, it's it's a it's a response to that sense of your affections being touched by the love that God has demonstrated toward you, and it is that operation of the perfect love working in you, as we've heard recently. I'm going to let it go. There's there's this wall between me and my my wife or my husband, or there's this wall between me and a brother or sister in Christ. Well, as much as lies within me, I am not going to build the wall. And if the wall's already there, I'm not going to build it any bigger. And I'm going to do everything I can to see that the wall comes down. And I can't cross over the wall and take care of the other person's heart, but I can sure work on mine, can't I? And you can too. And we're moved to that. He says, be kind to one another. Is it hard to be kind to one another? Sometimes it is, isn't it? Because we're still in this flesh. And people rub us. Tender hearted? Are you kidding me? Paul, you're getting just a little too deep there, a little too emotional there. That sounds too effeminate, tender-hearted, right? But no, be kind to one another, tender-hearted. I care about you. I care for you. And in a sense, it doesn't matter what you have done to me, Right? In a sense. I know there are other things we could say about that. But the pattern is forgiving one another, letting it go, even as God in Christ forgave you. Isn't it interesting the way that's termed? Or hath forgiven, but it's, a, it's, it's something that has happened. It's not something that was earned. It wasn't a process. God didn't say, okay, here's an installment of the forgiveness. Now, if you really perform well, I'll forgive more. I'll really let go of my judgment against you and my wrath upon you if fill in the blank. No, none of that. Even as God in Christ forgave you. It's 
complete. Nothing, nothing held against you. Therefore, do you see that? Verse 1 of chapter 5 follows that. Therefore, be imitators of God. As you're His dearly beloved children. And that's not just, that's not, Paul's not saying that simply so you will relish your relationship with God. He's saying that so that you will think deeply about your relationship to God and God's relationship to you so that it will affect you in your walk in love. Walk in love. Now this is coming from remembering. It's coming from thinking. It's not coming from just waiting for something to happen to you. You are engaged in this. Do you remember? You remember the scripture that says that as a man thinks in his heart. So this thing of heart isn't just affections. It includes affections. It includes your will. It includes your thinking. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You can tell what people are thinking about by how they're engaging. Wouldn't you say that's true? Remembering deeply. Remembering deeply. And so this is what I'm proposing to you is tonight. Remembering Him. Remembering deeply. I mean, really entering in is going to shape your life in some way. It's got to affect you. Tonight. But not limited to tonight. But certainly tonight. As we remember Him. And so may our affections be stirred and our wills impacted as we think upon Him together. Together. We're thinking upon Him together. He's your Savior. He's mine. He's loved you. He loved me. We're together in this thing. So that we might be more and more like him. Imitators of God.